What's good, folks? Welcome to another episode of the Cover One Film Room, the only show that gives you the hows and the whys behind both the good and the bad of the Buffalo Bills. I am one of your two hosts, Anthony Prohaska, joined as always by Eric Turner. Apologies for a lack of an episode last week. It's been two weeks for us, um, and that's 100% on me. I was death warmed up last week, Wednesday, and out of commission for Wednesday and Thursday and a good chunk of Friday with some kind of sickness virus don't Gets know all, but man. yeah Gets it was not it was not it was not great but i'm back on the mend we're back here in the film room we've got multiple people mm-hmm. to cover last wednesday the bill signed mike edwards we still got some curtis samuel pieces we've got some austin johnson stuff uh casey two hill will clap so there's been a good chunk of roster moves that have been made really since free agency open for the bills. Again, tying it back to what we did with Daquan and everything we've seen thus far, the moves mm-hmm. and players that happened in the Exodus the week before. So Eric, we've got a, a good amount of stuff to go through tonight from a player evaluation standpoint, tying it into this football team, this roster, and then tying that into where this team goes forward. Now, when you're looking towards the 2024 NFL draft, because in typical Brandon Bean fashion, he's done a really good job mitigating a bunch of the holes or needs on this roster, setting himself up and this team up in position to, you know, go for need, but really attack it from a best player available standpoint, like he tends to do year after year. Yeah, he's set the table very nicely uh, to kind of open up free agency and then that middle, uh, middle time of free agency. Um, he did a good job of rounding out the roster, as you said, kind of. Um, when you look at our depth chart that we've been, you know, kind of tracking over the last few weeks, um, you see less and less red, especially (laughs) as far as starters go on both sides of the ball, obviously some still, you know, still some spots open there to upgrade, um, whether we're talking starters or mainly depth, but he's done a good job, as you said, rounding out that roster, uh, adding some versatile pieces. I know Mm -hmm. it's something we love to talking personnel, scouting, evaluation, is you know the ability of players at x position to do a multitude of things and align in a multitude of different spots or areas and so you know some of these players that we're going to break down tonight some with film some with stats some with both um Mm -hmm. i I think you're going to hear that word a bunch you know versatility you know swiss army knife um but there's a lot to cover there's a lot of ground to cover uh, for these transactions with Bean rounding out that roster. And I'm excited to finally get to it here in the film room. Yeah. And, you know, before we dive into everything, as you sit here, we're a month, pretty much a month away from the draft, almost to the day, to the week. Where are your thoughts for, like, from a roster need standpoint? Do you think everything is kind of on even keel? Or are you still leaning towards, you know, more towards that interior defensive line? Does Austin Johnson change things a little bit for you? Mm-hmm. Where's your mind at? You know, you just did a mock draft up on Monday. Right. Um, you know, some folks go and check that out and see kind of maybe where Eric's head is at potential from a mock draft perspective. But, yeah, where's your head at when, you know, looking forward and tying things together um, for this roster? This is what's so fun about the off season. So like <laughs> one day it's okay. Right no, now. they're going to address this, you know? And then I watch some other players at another position. I like, you know, I can honestly see them adding this guy or this position because of X. And so I will say, and I, I will admit that uh, my, you know, ideal, you know, player or position, it usually changes probably every three to five days. Um, and, and so, um, I do think that interior defensive line, as you can see, is mm-hmm. still an area that they could upgrade and upgrade early, especially if you're talking about a three technique that can back up at Oliver. Cause as we talked about, when we're talking about uh, defensive tackles, the bills love to roll those guys and roll them quite frequently. So I mm-hmm. do think D line, uh, D tackle is still an area. And even though they added two Hill, as we'll talk about later, I still mm-hmm. think Edge is also, um, you know, an area that I think they could add, um, even though they brought back AJ Apinesa, I do think they um, want to kind of, I don't know, I don't want to say hedge, but damn near hedge, um, Mm. you know, Von Miller and where that group stands and how important that defensive line altogether is going to be to the back end of the secondary when you're talking about all the new pieces and different faces that could be, um, kind of like legitimized into their positions, whether we're talking Christian Benford, obviously Rasul is coming back. He's likely a starter. Um, and then obviously the safety positions are just going to be fun to watch unfold as the offseason progresses. So 
I, I will say right now, surprisingly enough, because I have been studying corners and I think <laughs> it was Anthony Marino that brought up a very good point and how, you know, corners not probably not likely early, especially if we're talking the 28th pick of the draft. But given Rasul being on, you know, his contract, Benford, um, solid player last year when he played. Obviously, when he's healthy, he's a pretty good player. Kyrie, mm -hmm. don't quite know. And, you know, there's a new uh, cornerback coach. I've been studying corners. And so right now I'm like, you know, I could see them going for a corner. And so, again, every day is a little different, Anthony. But that's what makes mm -hmm. the offseason so much fun. And we, you know, we kind of workshop our ideas here in the film room. And so um, that's something we're going to be doing up into the draft <laughs> over the next month or so. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, it's funny. It's, I, I didn't plan this at all, but it's funny you said corner. And the because the reason I asked you this is because corner has become, you know, I, I did the show, I did this guy's coverage last night with Russ and was talking about corner. And it's, I, I put a tweet out at the end of last week once I woke up from my coma. And it's just, it, Rasul Douglas being that UFA in 2025, I do think it was interesting that they restructured him this year mm -hmm. instead of extending him. Trey is obviously gone. And even just for this year, Kyrie Elam is corner three right now. Right. Which can be good. Also, yeah. he's still an unknown quantity to a degree with that inconsistency. Like, and so I can see Kyrie Elam being corner three. I could also see them drafting somebody to be like corner three or corner two ish or yeah. corner two waiting in the wings to take over for Rasul Douglas. And so that's been a position that I, I was like evaluating from a draft perspective in in like an auxiliary or ancillary fashion, like I'm watching Darius Robinson from Missouri. And as I'm doing that, I'm also watching like Ennis Rake straw and Chris Abrams drain the, right. the really good corners from Missouri and kind of little bits and pieces here and there. But as like the last couple of weeks have gone, yeah, I've just been like, are they going to go corner? Like what could, what could <laughs> happen the same, there? Dude, you're right? the same. <laughs> like, it's just, I don't know why I just have this. I have a feeling of like corner or like interior offensive line, just like some position where, because especially when you're looking at it, those first 27 picks before the Bills right. pick at 28, you're probably getting at least eight offensive linemen. You're potentially looking at four quarterbacks right now. Mm -hmm. Then you've got Brock Bowers, Quinion Mitchell's going to go. Like there's certain locks at other positions. Yes. Somebody good on either potentially – Maybe Latu falls, although I doubt it. Like, so Verse is going to go. Turner's going to go. There's a chance that a quality interior mm -hmm. offensive lineman falls or a quality defensive tackle potentially Happens falls or a year, quality yeah. corner. Yeah, like there's there's a legit chance where you're sitting there. I don't know. Maybe some teams prefer certain corners over others, but maybe right. Cooley McKinstry's there or Terry that's, and Arnold, the other corner from guy. Alabama. I've been oh, studying him the last two days. I've been studying him, and I, I hate to say it, and I hate to comp. You know that. I hate doing comps, but <laughs> – the first game I watched of him was against Georgia and mm. his movement, his technique, how he motors out into his back pedal, out of his back pedal in press man coverage in that bail technique, whatever technique he can align a multitude of ways. He's a very good technician. He's one of the smarter corners I've studied in the last mm. couple of years from the shoulders up and just his movement. Okay. Stylistically. Uh -oh. Uh oh, Trey, man, I knew I it. I was waiting for Trey, it. dude. And then I'm, so I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the measurables. I'm like, oh my God, they're so close. Go look at the measurables guys and then watch them stylistically and, and, you know, watch his film and you're going to come to a lot of the same conclusions. I, I got all my notes ready from the game, from the games I watched. And then I went back and looked at what I said about Trey man. And it's scary. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, like I said, the last two days I've been studying corners and he's one and. I hate to do comps, but man, he just reminded me of Trey so much. And then, of course, with the news of Trey signing, it just it was it was just a vibe I was on, man. I felt it. <laughs> Trying to like fill that hole in your yeah, heart, that Trey man. White size hole yes. in your heart. And he was, I mean, coming into this year was like the preseason, like CB one. And yeah. I feel like with so many dudes that are anointed, like the preseason one. As seasons go along, the same thing happened to Will Anderson last year. I'm not saying they're the same level of prospect, but as the season went on, I was like, is Will Anderson still a really good player? <laughs> like, is it's yeah. like, why, why are we doing this to Will Anderson? Why are we trying to overthink how good of a duty is? And, oh, you know, is Tyree Wilson better than Will Anderson? It's like, no, nope, oh, no, he's not. No, like, no. don't do this to yourself. Yeah. And, you know, some of the other corners have risen a bit. Mm. You know, Wiggins, Rose, and, and Terry and Arnold, his running mate there. Yeah. But, yeah, there's some quality, like, first-round corners that are going to be available there. And, 
I don't know why. Like, I just, I just had this sneaking feeling. There's been so much conversation of like wide receiver. And then like, it was safety for a little bit at time. And then it's like, Oh, you know, back to wide receiver. I just feel like it's going to be some position yep. where the name is called and the fans are like, Oh, and they're not upset, yep. but they're like, really? We took a, a center or really? We went corner. Right. Like, I, and, but again, and that's yeah, why what be Bean there. did here, right? What Bean did here and kind of eliminating, you know, those red spots that were in, you know, the nose tackle position and, and places like that, it's setting himself up so he doesn't have to reach so that he can, yes, it's a cliche. He can let the board come to him <laughs> and, you know, fall, those guys fall to him. It's a cliche, but there is some truth behind it, as he talked about in the podcast recently or uh, one of his appearances. Um, so, so obviously those type of moves, you know, even they're getting uh, an Austin Johnson or a mm. Casey Tuhill, like those, you know, solid pickups, nothing crazy. But as we'll talk about as we get through some of these guys' names, these signings don't preclude anything. So they kind of like it's kind of like uh, smoke and mirrors, right? Like, okay, yeah. we signed this guy, we don't need depth there, but do we? You know, like you just never Could know. We? Being sneaky, he's a wizard. You got to remember that he's a wizard, right. and you know he does these things for a reason. Every single year, he's yeah. done it every single year. So. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I could see that curveball coming, and I do think corner is one of those positions. Interior offensive line. I, I mean, hey, give me a reason. To, you know, give us a reason to study right. interior offensive line. Like, I'm, I'm down. Like, I, I studied them all last week. Like, let's, let's go. Um, so I could see that happening for sure. Yeah, just some kind of weird like Jackson Powers Johnson falls, mm. or maybe they really dig Zach Frazier, or just somebody. I just see. I sent some pick where people are going to be like. A.D. Mitchell is on the board. They're going to take Mitchell, and it's like, right. psych, here comes nope. a corner, and everybody's <laughs> going to be like, we we went corner, and then like, I don't know, just some three tech in the second round to make everybody more upset. They'll be like, okay, they're right. going to take receiver in round two now. Um, oh, see, and Guards, like, guards yeah. is a solid position to look at, too. I, I think that'd be, uh, especially day two, there are some solid guys in that day two range, uh, rounds two and three. Uh, at guard, some with center guard flexibility. I think, mm -hmm. you know, Powers Johnson is one of those guys that can play both positions and yep. has played both positions. But I like the flexibility of a guy like that. Cooper Beebe, as Mike says, is, is a guy with a lot of game experience, some nastiness, uh, kind of on the bigger side, mm -hmm. more like Osiris Torrance, uh, you mm -hmm. know, last year for, for the Bills. So, yeah, I mean, he's another guy um, at a position at guard, interior offensive line that I could see the Bills addressing early. Uh, whether we're talking day one, late first round, or uh, day two, hundred percent, man, I'm with you. And, and that's why that's why the off is so much fun, man. And studying all these guys and getting an idea of you know guys that we think are fits yeah. and different positions because you just you never know, man. The draft is there's always those curveballs, and uh, and regardless of what team you root for, there's going to be curveballs thrown your way. Absolutely. Um, and I like that call out from Mike. I like uh, you know somebody who you and I both really like, you know Byron Murphy from Texas. Mm. That Texas versus Kansas State tape, mm -hmm. BB is battling Murphy and mm -hmm. getting the better of him on several reps. Like I thought BB was going to come out last year. He went back to school. Um, there's a it offensive line in general in this in this class is so deep. Like tackles and uh, tackles and the interior, like center and guard. Like you have oh nice comment. And this there is from Arena. true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. That, yeah, the cost stuff. of those positions are going up year after year, and you know as D tackle has kind of been up there anyways. And, and more of those studs coming uh, out of college at that D tackle position, you got to offset that. And obviously the Bills face some very good D tackles in the AFC East, uh, you know, a couple times a year. Yeah, and I mean, even the AFC in general, like Matabuki mm -hmm. staying there with Baltimore. You've got Jeffrey Simmons over there in Tennessee. Like there's – yeah, quit quit in your face in twice a year. At mm -hmm. least you know Christian Wilkins is out of the division, but he's still uh, Chris Jones, in the of AFC. course. I mean, yeah, yeah Chris so Jones just won't go away. Like, yeah, and you got to be able to protect that depth of the pocket. Like, right. and and, ooh, and this is also like part of the fun conversation. Just this, and then especially too, like with the Bills having eleven picks, do they package any of them? Do they trade down? Do they trade up? Like, do they take all eleven? Are we sitting here? on that Sunday, evaluating all 11 players that the Bills took in this draft, or they trade in some of that quantity for more quality in terms right. of pick theirs. And then tying into that is all the directions that they can potentially go in because of the moves that they have made on this roster. And <clears throat> Eric, you know, let's, let's transition to that piece. Um, now with Mr. <laughs> Mr. Will Clapp, new Buffalo <laughs> Bill. Um, yeah, again, another move that, 
again, you start to mitigate, bring in some bodies, you know, so you're not sitting there with any glaring holes. So a move that, okay, cool, bring in a body, get yourself some help, but also doesn't preclude you from, again, going early into the interior offensive line or making this a priority kind of addressing in the draft. Right, and he's a guy that has ties to um, New the New Orleans Saints. I like his size. This is where we should start the conversation. Versatility, obviously, he's played damn near every position along the offensive line, but as we have outlisted there, uh, listed there, you can see the different uh, positions. Uh, last year, he did just under 700 snaps at center. Uh, in 2022, with uh, the Chargers, 327 at center as well. But then you can see in 2021, 58 at center, 10 at left guard, 65 snaps as the extra offensive lineman, mm -hmm. in-line tight end, kind of that Bates role, right? And, and mm -hmm. I could see him doing that for the Bills next year because even in 2019 with New Orleans, he had 124 snaps at that position in that role. And then right guard, 93 snaps, 86 at left guard that season, six at center. So you can see he's he's got snaps damn near across the entire offensive line, also plays that. Again, that extra offensive lineman in those heavy sets. Um, again, very reminiscent of Bates. 6'4", 311 pounds. And I think that size is something interesting and that we should talk about and why it's important. You alluded to it just a second ago. With Connor McGovern switching to center, it does sound and seem like the Bills, for now, want to get bigger up the middle at that pivot position. Why do you think that is so important, Anthony, when it comes to offenses in general, but also to a quarterback like Josh Allen. We talked about, we talked about it a bit with that McGovern move to center and that ability to anchor the ability to control the interior of the pocket and that depth of the pocket to allow your quarterback to step up, to be able to maintain those rush lanes uh, against interior defensive linemen. Again, like the multitude of strong interior defensive line play that you're going to see in that AFC, but it's really so disruptive for quarterbacks in general, but especially like today when you have that interior presence that can just cause problems right in the A gap or even in that B gap and just get right through like edge pressure is still something very significant in, sure. in football. Like let's not discount that. But when you've got game wreckers on the inside or guys that can compromise the depth of that pocket and push guards or centers into the lap of a quarterback, even as one is, you know, nimble and, you know, navigation sound in the pocket, like Josh is at times. And that's something that, you know, as much as we love Mitch Morse, you would see from time to time, because he was mm -hmm. a bit of a smaller center, like getting driven back into that pocket a little bit. And clap is very much in that mold in terms of play style, frame, body type, um, similar to McGovern. Like when we talked about, of, you know, why, you know, Morse gone, Bates gone, McGovern to center, Edwards to guard. Like, why would they do right. this? And one of the things we Quite initially pointed up, out, yeah, yeah huge shakeup. Mm -hmm. And the first thing was, you know, what's Connor McGovern's calling card? His ability to anchor. Mm -hmm. What do you, what does that mean? If you have a really good anchor as a center, it means you're probably maintaining the depth of the pocket up front and clap is another move in that direction. Right. And when you're able to anchor at that pivot position up the middle, that means you don't have to keep your guards in as long to help. And now that gives your tackles who have were on an island a good amount last yeah. year. When you look at some of the advanced metrics, that allows those guards to use that help technique a lot more and and help out. And instead of the center being the pivot and, and being the help technique, you're able to just put him on an island and then let everyone else, you know, kind of sort things out uh, across the offensive line. But it also does open up some different protections that you can do when you're not worried about the interior of the pocket being pushed into the quarterback's face. But when it comes to clap, I, I, I do think again, this doesn't pre <laughs> this doesn't preclude you from drafting a center. Correct. This doesn't preclude you from drafting a guard or a guy that has that interior offensive uh, line flexibility. But I just, when, when you have a guy like that, when we had Bates in the film room and we asked him like, how the hell did you prepare for mm. all those positions each and every week? And in the answer he gave us was just like, you know what? Honestly, I, I think he took most of his snaps at, was it at center? He said it is mm -hmm. like, I took most of my snaps as the backup to Mitch Morse. And then he had to start at guard that year. And he was like, you know what? But I, I had to know my stuff on paper. I had to go through mental reps. And so even though I'm not the biggest fan of clap and I, again, I think they could still draft a guy at that position. Mm -hmm. I do want to give him credit because in order to do that and align all these different positions, you have to have a certain sense of football IQ and processing mm -hmm. and that commitment to 
learn all these positions and be ready when your number is called. And so um, I, I do think that is probably his greatest value um, to this offensive line. But again, I don't think when we're talking draft impact, I don't think it impacts the draft at all. No, I completely agree. And then having, having McGovern with that true starting capability at center and guard, mm -hmm. and then pairing, you know, that also with David Edwards coming back on that two year deal. But, you know, in 2025, he's only got a dead cap hit of 875 K. So even though it's a two year deal, if things don't work out with Edwards, you really could say goodbye to him after this season. Same and you're not, thing. and yep. you're not paying him really starting money, even if he's here with that two year, $6 million deal. And so that's why I think you put all these moves in conjunction, like Morse going away, Bates going away, Edwards bring, being brought back, McGovern moving to center, Edwards to guard, Clap coming in. There's all these moves where you're kind of, you know, rising, raising mm -hmm. that floor a little bit and mitigating some things, but none of these are like, well, the offensive line is set. Like, I could see them taking yeah. a Cooper BB or, <laughs> exactly. again, not to keep, like, drilling that horse or beating that horse. If Jackson Powers Johnson falls, I'm running to the podium at he's 28. Such, he's such a Cromer guy, dude. He really Grounded, is like anchors, like – Great hand techniques, like he's yeah. I can and the, and and on top of all of that, like him. <laughs> he moves really well. Moves like really well. I was surprised as hell. We we talked about it night one when we were in Mobile that Monday mm -hmm. night well, before we went to dinner. He weighed in at three thirty, and I was like, the way he moves on tape, I would have never thought he weighed three thirty. But let's see how he moves. And then he's out there at practice every day, dominating and moving yeah. like he does on tape. And I'm like, okay, I guess he really does play at three thirty. Yeah. And then if you look at his 2022 tape when he played guard, you're like, mm -hmm. oh. And he's doing all those things we talked about with Dawkins when he's pulling and Brown when they're pulling, you know, logging, yeah. kick out. Like, I'm like, oh, okay. So he can actually play guard. He's not just aligning there no. as a filler type position. Like, he can actually play guard too. So um, I think, you know, I, I, someone in the comment section in one of our videos, like, he's the second common with Creed Humphrey. I mean, he's oh, pretty man. close. He's pretty close. Um, and so, uh, again, interior offensive line, I do think that it's, uh, whether you're talking Edwards, like you said, or Will Clapp, I, I don't think it really impacts their draft. If anything, again, it just gives them kind of like some smoke. Like, yeah. We're not looking at interior yeah. offensive linemen, but then they draft a guy high, you know? So um, keep an open mind when it comes to the draft. I mean, that's something we're just going to keep saying yeah, up, until, keep over and over. up until draft night, basically. And even too, like, again, with McGovern, because he can play guard or center that opens them up to either take primarily a center or primarily a guard at some point, yeah. or somebody who does have that flex. And then you kind of mix and match again, just another reason to potentially keep your options open and similar to the will clap signing. But I think potentially a tier above with this next player, Casey two Hill coming over to the Buffalo bills from the Washington commanders edge has been a need for this team. Eric, you and I have talked about defensive line in general this off season with the lack of bodies they had under contract, both in terms of quality and quantity, they bring in two Hill who, again, I think kind of ticks that box for the floor, sets you up for that edge number four in terms of his play style and what he can be. But again, in that similar vein that we echoed with clap doesn't preclude you from taking an edge in the first round. If somebody falls, you know, if Latu Latu falls, you're not like, well, we got Casey to Hill already. So we don't right. need to take Latu. but there are some things that two Hill does uh nice. You ID him early in this off season in terms of being a guy that um, could fit this team, especially from an affordability standpoint. Right. And lo and behold, here we are with some advanced metrics for Mr. Casey to Hill. Yeah, two hill coming over from the commander, six, four, 254 pounds, long arms, 30, 33 and, a mm -hmm. quarter arm length. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys, I, I think he's that traditional DN, you know, four in yep. this system. Uh, he is a bigger, bigger type uh, edge guy in the mold of like a Shaq Lawson. But I do think he's a little more athletic than Shaq Lawson. Is he as good at setting the edge versus the run and playing the run? Probably not, but mm -hmm. it's still one of his strengths. Yes. Just not like Shaq is elite when it comes to edge setting as a DN he's up there with Rousseau. He doesn't, doesn't get the accolades, but that is where he hangs his hat. And I think two Hill has some of that just to a lesser degree, but he's got more effort and hustle and chase, chase down stuff, chase down, down closing yeah. speed. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think athletically, I think he is, he's higher in, in yeah. regards to that. He's more athletic. Um, he does a good job of tracking the quarterback, whether, you know, it's a three or five step drop. He does a good job of, getting to that depth and not getting beyond him. So again, tracking the ball, tracking the quarterback in the pocket. 
and just does a really good job um, with his hand usage. It's very accurate mm. when he when he you know gets his hands on a blocker, whether that's a tight end or tackle. You're gonna see that that contact. You see that jolt, that shock, and he does a good job of using that and timing that up, that pop with you know being able to disengage because the ball's now outside the tackle box or the the outside zone run kind of bent back inside. He's using that pop and that shock. Uh, in hitting those landmarks to just give him enough freedom, whether it's an inside or outside hand, to break free, to disengage, and to make the tackle. So overall, as you can see, you can see some of his stats on the screen, um, courtesy of True Media. Um, the one thing I did find interesting, um, as we break it down by first down, second down, third down, his sacks per pressure it was fourth among all defensive linemen with 100-plus snaps. Mm -hmm. His overall sacks per pressure was at 33.3% overall. So. That's something to keep an eye on, you know, his ability to, when he does rush a passer, his ability to, um, again, get that edge and get that pressure quickly and, and you know, not just get pressures, get a few pressures, but then eventually land a sack on the back end. Yeah, and, and I think you hit a lot of the calling card points when it comes to two hill. Um, I thought this was, again, like a fine signing for what he is. Like, you're not looking at him and being like, well, they're like, who cares what Von Miller does? Because Casey two hill is your edge two right now. Um, I, you, I, I, my first thing in my notes here for me was just the motor. Like you see him constantly working and it's not always the cleanest or the prettiest, but he just grinds and he works like he's coming off the ball with urgency. He comes off the ball with purpose. Like you're not seeing any lag or slack from him. I love the, uh, comparison there to Shaq, like with, with how he sets that edge. And like you said, you know, two hill, I think is a step down in that regard, but what he, what you lose for with that you make up for with the athleticism um, and and some of that effort. And this is a really nice rep that you highlighted here, like the hand placement on that inside, as you have highlighted there on that box, gets outside, uses that right arm, that long arm, stabs inside, gets the extension. He's peeking around the corner to make sure he's maintaining his spot. He sees the track of Tony Pollard, gets back inside, and is able to close that piece down. You see that regularly from him. And again, that's yeah. tied to that pop that you mentioned, that shock in those hands. I love that you called out the placement, too, of his hands because I, I think there's some times where – even when things are muddy and he's not getting away completely clean, the initial hand placement and pop is still there. Um, and I like that he wins against tight ends. Like if you're going to be, yeah. and if you're going to be worth your salt in any way, shape or form as an edge in this league, you have to consistently beat tight ends. This is a good rep right here against Tyler Higby, number 89 for the Rams. And you see him just get right into his chest, knock him back drive. And then again, what is he doing? Similar to that clip against Dallas as he's controlling his man, He's looking into the backfield. He's reading the track of that running back, and he's able to get that shoulder or that you know side of his body into the hole to make a play on the ball. Yeah, it's not always pretty, but he somehow he gets it, it done. Yeah, and and oh, the hand usage there. That one's I a mean, great one. Yep. Yeah, I mean, again, setting that edge, keeping that outside hand free. Then watch the arm lift with the left hand right there, arm lift right there. Then he's again tracking the ball, and then as that running back bounces outside, he gets free and makes a tackle. So. It's not always pretty, but he gets it. He gets the job done again. A DN four doesn't yep. really impact the draft. As far as I'm concerned, I still think you try to bring in, uh, you know, a younger player at that edge position to compete with him, to compete with Kingsley, Jonathan, um, and any, anyone else that they bring in as far as camp bodies go. Uh, I do think that it's a solid floor. If are talking DN four mm -hmm. and how the bills like to rotate things, uh, it doesn't force or doesn't, um, really make Brandon Bean go out and draft a guy early at edge. You can just, again, let the chips fall as they may and and try to add, you know, maybe even a different type of player than him. Mm -hmm. You know, I love the chase down on these next few plays, yeah. um, especially this one versus Hurts. Watch him, you know, run that arc and then just the circle Typical. rush and then chase him down from behind. Motor, so, motor, motor. Yeah, all hustle, all effort. And so I think he, again, he brings a lot of what Shaq Lawson does, um, but he's a little, has a little more athletic uh, upside to him and uh, that motor is still there uh, to to help out you know close out rushes and when you're talking about the pass rush game because as good as Shaq was against the run a lot of his you know pressures came very late because of secondary um, coverage and how things are muddied up on, or disguised on the back end so uh, it'll be interesting to see again what direction the Bills go in the draft when it comes to edge I do think they bring one in and that guy will definitely compete with uh, Two Hill. 
when you're talking the edge position. And you mentioned it uh, as well. I like the arm length, you know, being there at six, four and having 33 and a quarter inch arms. And like, he uses it. I like that. I like edges with long arms. We obviously know the bills do as well. You know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge towards Gregory Rousseau. <laughs> um, and he's sitting there on a one year, you know, $1.14 million contract. He's got a dead cap at this year of 15,000. So there's a chance like he could not be on this roster, but again, he raises your floor a little bit at that edge four spot. And you, you know, if you're sitting there trying to round out a group, he makes perfect sense in that, at that bottom end of that rotation, like a high, high effort, high motor type of dude who plays the run, who's going to grind on every snap. Like you're looking for a guy when you rotate Rousseau or Epinesa or Vaughn out, you're looking for a dude that's going to go a hundred miles an hour, a hundred percent of the time. And that's Casey Tuhill. And, you know, we'll see again, what they do from right. adding to that position. Cause much like the will clap <clears throat> move, this is not a move that precludes them from addressing that edge spot. And Eric, we stay on the defensive line move towards Mr. Austin Johnson. I was two years early. He was my guy <laughs> two years ago. I remember going into that episode of the film room. You had Daquan and I had Austin mm -hmm. Johnson. They went with Daquan. Austin Johnson went to the chargers um, but lo and behold, here he is. Daquan Jones, ironically, was the one to kind of break the news. Yeah, that's it, hilarious. Funny. Like just full circle. Think, yeah, li as, absolutely full circle. Um, I like the signing a lot. You know, you get that second level one tech behind Daquan Jones, smart veteran player. Um, you know, as you pull up his clips there mm -hmm. uh for the Chargers where he's been the past couple of years, which is just a defense that was so weird and wonky in a lot of ways, no matter who they added just structurally and schematically with who and what they were. But this is a really nice option. I like the cost of it, obviously, but then I think this is a phenomenal, like this is your second tier one tech behind Daquan Jones. Cool signing. Really like the depth, really like the piece and what he offers. Again, I'm a little biased though, because I still remember him from two years ago. Yeah, when he was uh he's with the Giants then, right? Yep. And uh he was definitely a guy that uh, we had targeted. And you know, he's six four, three hundred and fourteen pounds, thirty-two and three quarter arm length. It's funny because if you look at mock draftable and look at the spider chart in comparison uh of Austin Johnson versus some of his peers, the number one guy that he's compared to his comparable is daquan jones it's yep. number one <laughs> but the funny thing is while you know physically he's probably you know a mirror of daquan jones his style reminds me more of star and i know a lot of people mm. be like oh well damn well yeah, I'm not right excited about people this. are gonna be like oh yeah. that's an insult yeah they're turning us off as we speak um but i i think from a strength and power sense when we when i you know kind of outline uh, outlined him in the article for the website uh for his profile his signature trait was his strength his power mm -hmm. and i think that's that's what i mean by that when you're talking stylistically you're going to see him disengage and control offensive alignment because of his power not necessarily because of his flexibility or his quickness off the ball he does a great job at the point of attack with his power he can one or two gap and there's some violent plays some like violent hands mm -hmm. violent shedding some club moves kind of reminiscent of Daquan. Um, but I do think he is also an early down type player. Um, and maybe that's, maybe that's the plan because when we did the workup for Daquan, one of the things that we kind of noticed was that a lot of Daquan's production last year came on first and second down. Well, maybe, maybe Austin Johnson is now that early down player. And now you can save some of that, those reps and manage the load of Daquan and use him more in those third, fourth down situations, in those critical moments in the red zone and whatnot, maybe they're able to kind of, again, get a two for one when you're talking early down, being able to stop the run, but also affecting the quarterback on those pass downs. Yeah, or, you know, maybe you're just going to keep leaning to the early down stuff because you're going to draft Johnny Newton at 28 and then you're just going to go, go crazy on third yep. downs. Yep. Uh, but it, I, I really like the signing. You hit a lot of pieces on the head. I, Despite him being, you know, more of that one tech mold, I think he moves better than like what people think a standard one tech is. And you've seen it on a bunch of these clips, like the quickness that he shows in like going from gap to gap, like not even just coming forward and penetrating into the gap. He's initially responsible for pre-snap or aligned in pre-snap. I should say like his ability to just have that lateral agility and flexibility in his game. Um, I think he's got good grip strength. Um, I like the pop that he shows going up against offensive linemen, you'll see him knock guys back and you'll see, mm -hmm. you know, offensive linemen heads and shoulders and upper body kind of go back a little bit. And then there's clips like that one against Denver where he's just winning because of quickness and athleticism for a there's dude. Another at, one, right? 
yes. another lateral yes. step here, right here. Yep. Watch that lateral step to his right, and then into the back gap there, and shoots the back door and makes the tackle. And that's beautiful. Like that's a zone working. That's a zone run working to the right, and he's mm -hmm. able to just cross gaps and get upfield and beat that inside. Like gets inside there on uh, Allegretti there, number seventy three for the Chiefs. I again, this is. I would have been okay with him. If he was, and you know, you had him on your free agent um, right. wish list. I would have been okay with him as like a bargain deal starter to come in op like opposite of Ed Oliver. The fact that he's like, again, that's kind of not worst case scenario to be disrespectful, but like I, I love him as a backup one tech. I would have been okay with him even being in the starter because of what he has. And I also think with him, with what he did with the giants, but then more so with, the chargers these past couple of years with the type of fronts that they use. I do yeah. think it's interesting, like his ability to one gap, but also two gap and playing. Mm -hmm. And you're, and you guys are seeing it a bunch of these in these clips, like where he's sometimes the end, right? Yes. Sometimes at the end in a three, four or odd yes. front. Yes. And with, you know, we saw it from time to time with the bills last year, you know, some bear, some cub front, we saw mm -hmm. some tight front stuff. And so with, you know, I don't know, maybe they stay in nickel, but they're bringing in Austin Johnson on the field and it's only one D end and it's like Austin Johnson, Ed Oliver and Daquan Jones on that D line or, you know, kind of mm -hmm. just it gives you another option to kind of mix and match with heavier personnel and packages or low red zone type of work or certain down and distances. Um, I think he gives you some versatility with his size and frame and athleticism and skill set. And this is again, it's not like breaking the bank and you're sitting there being like committed to him for four or five years. But I think this is a really nice contract, a really nice player. And considering that he's going to be that, you know, again, that backup one tack, that defensive tackle three, or depending on what happens in the draft defensive tackle four, sitting there on a one year, you know, $3.5 million deal. Um, I think the contract works, the style yeah. of fit works. Um, this is a move that I I'm very happy that they made. And the draft impact, as you said, I don't think it, I think it changes the nose tackle yes. acquisition. It changes right? which defensive, which right. type of defensive tackle type you go for. And it doesn't roll mean you're and not trait. going. Right. So I, I think, you know, the, the Bills, one of the spots on this depth chart early on in free agency was nose tackle. That was red. Absolutely. And it was, these were all red, except for Ed Oliver, basically. Eli Anku was, you know, the backup there, uh, depth player at D tackle, at nose tackle. But, now that they brought Daquan back and they brought in Austin Johnson, I do think when it comes to the draft, whether you're scouting um, the draft right now and, and defensive tackles, I think you should start to pivot to more of those attack-oriented three techniques um, as far as uh, those positions because um, they are, as I, we have outlined there, you know, I do think that you know the backup to Ed Oliver is the D-tackle and type of D-tackle that they need to start looking at because the nose tackle position, I think, is pretty set. While you can put Daquan and Austin at three tech in certain looks, um, they're not going to be the up-the-field, attack-oriented type um, that you want out there. And again, mm -hmm. we, we will see on how they manage uh, the load of Daquan Jones because we talked about it uh, a couple weeks ago in the film room. Getting him to the end of the season healthy is incredibly important mm -hmm. and has been the last two years. The D-line struggled last year against the chiefs at the end of the year. And obviously Daquan was still working his way back. He, he was not a hundred percent, but you can tell that, you know, having him healthy at the end of the season mm. is critical. You know, it's critical to the bills pressure up the front and how their defense, you know, really operates is that D line being the engine. Yeah. And you know, him being a 32 years old, you, you yeah. know, maybe you look at that type of like load management aspect and, Austin Johnson gives you some of that from like an early down regular season perspective to help kind of get Daquan to the finish line. And then depending on what you pair him with um, or what, yeah, what you pair him with in terms of your backup three tech. And again, like if, if anyone and everyone, uh, you know, was potentially hanging their head on Tavondre sweat, I didn't really think it was a fit before. It's definitely right. not really happening now. Nope. Um, unless they get him in and he drops like 50 pounds, maybe, <laughs> which I guess isn't too crazy, but yeah, now you're really looking towards, um, yeah, potentially Johnny Newton, or you're looking at those Dwayne Carters, or uh, you know, even Michael Hall is one who I keep coming back to from Ohio State, even though it's yeah, small. He's, but like he's gaining of, some more traction here. He did stand out uh, down in Mobile too, right? Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, and and again, now he's the type of guy. Like early on, we were like, I'm sorry, yes. nose tackle is a bigger need. We didn't focus on him, but now with that that 
backup three tech being kind of a uh, in that red in in, in a, a position that they can upgrade. Now a guy like him does make sense. He is now in play more so than the nose tackle position. Absolutely. So you start to shift that focus. So it's nice to see, again, them raise kind of that floor and along the defensive line as a whole with what they've done this offseason. Bringing back Epinesa, bringing in Two Hill, bringing in Austin Johnson. This position has gone from red alert, top priority, to still one of note, still one that you need to address, but one that doesn't have to have as many resources allocated towards it, kind of even potentially showing your hand a little bit come draft time and now we stick on that defensive side of the ball mike edwards a move that um i think a bunch of us were clamoring for on the network he was in the the, the once the free agent dust started to settle at the safety spot my hope was for justin simmons quandre Diggs, or mike edwards lo and behold they finally get mike edwards you get someone with that super bowl pedigree coming off another super bowl win here with kansas city after having one with tampa bay several years ago and yeah this move just seemed like it ticked so many boxes right from the get-go when you're talking about fit and play style, you know, mentally and physically and who he is. Um, this is just a move that, again, just it seems like such a good marriage from a Bills yeah. defense fit player perspective. I mean, everything. It, you know, when he was coming out of Kentucky, uh, a captain, a ton of game experience. He was a fit for this defense back then. Uh, and with... Poyer and Hyde out. I mean, he's now again, there's going to be a drop off, obviously, mm -hmm. but it's not much from an experience standpoint when it comes to how he boosts a defensive coordinator's ability to disguise coverages. He is a guy that is very instinctive, always trusts his eyes, which is important in this vision based system. McDermott and Babish, they want their guys just playing fast, playing free, trusting what they see, trusting in their technique. He's going to do all of that. Yeah. He played in 21 games last year, 774 snaps, 63 solo tackles. He missed 15 tackles last year. That is an area that you will see on film where he's going to miss tackles, but he's always around the ball. So those mm -hmm. type of things happen. It's kind of like Milano, right? You like, you kind of live with some of those chances and those attempts at tackling, uh, especially when you're coming from depth, like he does a bunch, mm -hmm. as you'll see in, uh, in the, in the film room. Uh, but I'm sorry. I said, 63 tackles that was total tackles 39 solo um he even pitched in a sack there but last year he he just last year and the year before whether you're talking in kansas city and tampa his plays on the ball just have skyrocketed the mm. last few years when you're talking interceptions you're talking pass breakups he's just always around the ball has that knack for doing it and uh, i think he's gonna be a really good fit regardless of how much two high safety looks they play or single high safety looks they play. He can, he's versatile, right? He's versatile. Yes. He can align in different places, you know, two high safety looks, single high safety looks, dime backer looks like he's going to be fun to watch and very critical in disguise and coverages going forward. He's just somebody who I don't think he's the sexiest name and he, I don't think he does anything. Although I, he, his eyes are good. His processing is good. Like you can trust when he moves, like you trust that he's making the right decision. Um, but he just seems to do everything above average. Like there's nothing, there's nowhere where he's deficient. Like he's usually right. in the right place at the right time. He's pretty responsible minus some of the missed tackle pieces, but even going back and watching him um, against the bills this past year, it was the first game I went to uh, from the tape and you just see him like pick double, collecting... digit, double digit tackles in that game. Yep, I think 11 tackles in 11, that game. Yeah. And from a coverage standpoint, you're just watching him pick up guys and collect guys from the route distribution. Mm -hmm. And he's canceling guys and taking guys away. Even when Allen's scrambling, like you see him immediately turn. It's like when Allen scrambles, he's immediately like, I know what my guy behind me is mm -hmm. doing. And he turns around, gets his eyes right to him and he gets sticky. Like, He's just a smart, savvy veteran player for still being a young guy as well. Um, and then coming in on a one-year, $2.8 million deal. So, like, right now he's penciled mm -hmm. in as your starting safety, but you're yeah. not necessarily committed long-term. So, again, you still could address safety come draft time. But this, is, I think, is a nice high-floor signing and kind of stabilizes that safety room. Yeah, just to round out some of the stats, Chris, our producer, he uh, I think it was him that rounded up these stats. So, he was seventh of 66 safeties in reception percentage allowed. With fit, uh, and that's among all safeties with 50% of the snaps. Um, so at 57.1%, so very top 10 in that department. And then he also was fourth of 91 safeties with five plus targets in total EPA at negative 5.7, which is a good thing. Yes. So very productive when you're talking, you know, just basic metrics like tackles and, and whatnot, but also some of the advanced metrics in 
um, in coverage. And Justin has a great question here. I love you know to discuss this. He says, "Were Poyer and Hyde better than Edwards when they first came to Buffalo?" What are your thoughts on that? So Poyer for me was a very much an unknown quantity, like in in at that time where I was. So if I'm saying of who was better when they first came to Buffalo, like obviously knowing what Poyer became, but if right. I had to choose like Poyer coming in from the Browns or Edwards coming in, I think I probably would have leaned Edwards, like knowing what he is from a at this point, at this point yeah. right now, like not at this point, just when you hear the name announced and being familiar with their game. But a lot of that for me, again, I wasn't too familiar with Poyer Hyde. I was a big fan of from his time at Iowa. And then with his time at green Bay. So I think Hyde was better than Edwards when he came to Buffalo I think Edwards was better than Poyer in his time that he came to Buffalo. But again, a lot of that for Poyer is he was banged up and we, I, I didn't really get to see a lot of what he was or could have been because of his time in Cleveland. Yeah. I think the way you rank that with, you know, Hyde being better than Edwards as, when, you know, he came to Buffalo, but then also Edwards being uh, better than Poyer. I think that's true, but I will say the caveat to that is I think they're, Poyer and, and Hyde were unknowns in many ways too. Yes, true. Uh, to the Bills when they were coming to Bills. Why? I mean, even Hyde too was like a punt returner it's, nickel. And a nickel. Who, and a yeah. nickel. And that's where I'm going with this. Like, he didn't play safety. And that was a huge shakeup, a huge move, a projection. And they paid him pretty well to make that move. And so there was some level and degree of unknown to Hyde's game transitioning to safety. Now, Poyer, when I popped on his film with Cleveland, he had some semi-productive years, maybe not to the productive, uh, the consistency of Mike Edwards, but they play the same. And so when I popped on his film and I saw him, the first play I, I, I watched from Poyer, I had no idea who he was. I'll be honest. I had no <laughs> idea who he was. He was a split high safety look, and it was against the Eagles. They tried running a perimeter run, and he's coming from depth. We always talk about mm -hmm, it. He mm -hmm. came from depth. And I, I think it was Jason Peter who's, who was a left tackle. Peters was going to block him, and he just sacrificed his body, threw his body right into Jason Peters, mucked everything up, and the run took like a one-yard loss or it was like a zero-yard zero yard gain. And I'm like, this guy, who's that guy? <laughs> is a McDermott type of guy. And so I think consistency-wise, yeah, he wasn't quite the known, um, you know, known product mm -hmm. or player that Edwards is at this given moment. But I, I, I do see the similarities in play. When – I scouted Edwards down at the senior bowl. I just had, I said, he's just like a, a he's got that dog mentality, just like mm -hmm. Taryn and just like Poyer and quick story. I've told it a couple times here on the network, but so when Mike Edwards was at the senior bowl and this was at a time when early on in, in our scouting, um, down there in mobile, you could actually just pull players down there in the wild, lobby. wild West down there, man. dude, it was a wild West. So you could literally be in the lobby of where the, the players stay and where all the, you know, front office personnel stay. You could sit in the lobby and just, just wait, just you're creep. outside their just room creep. waiting for them to get room service. So you're just jumping in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All you, all you got a cheeseburger and now guess what? Now you're getting pulled for an interview. So I'm sitting there waiting and this is, I believe this is my first year down there. And so, you know, I'm just waiting. I was like, Oh, there's Mike Edwards. I can see him playing in and fitting in the bill scheme. And so I want to interview him. And so I'm walking up to him and then the bills, uh, I think it was the bills Northeast scout at the time just yanked him. I'm like, no. And so I'm like, all right, I see how it is. Okay. So I'm just going <laughs> to sit at the bar and I'm just going to wait. Cause I want to get this interview. And after like an hour, man, they were sitting there in the, in the lobby for like an hour. I'm like, I tapped out. I'm like, I, I gotta go. I gotta go do some content. And so, they were obviously interested in him in him back then, and they were doing their homework on him. He's a guy that, again, had a ton of experience in that system at Kentucky. He was a captain. He had all the mm -hmm. processy things that we used to preach early on when this regime was trying to build that foundation. I thought he was a fit then. I'm glad, it again, it came full circle. Now they bring him in uh, to uh, appear to be the starter, at least one of the starters for the Bills next year. Yeah, and he races the floor of that safety spot, and especially if they're going to play – these two high looks as they have done with like cover two and four and you know quarters and even some six at, 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 at to a time, like he and Taylor rap fit that style. And you know what rap can do coming from depth and Edwards, you know, can come from depth as well. But I also like too what Edwards can do um, coming down in some single high alignments, like as your, you know, whole player or that, mm -hmm. or that rat um, or robber, or even some of the dime linebacker stuff that he does at times, what I think is, which I think is interesting. So it's like, okay, do they, 
what happened? Do they add another safety at some point? And that is Edwards, the dime linebacker, but really we were only seeing dime linebacker because of the injury to Milano. Well, so like, yeah, like it, exactly. it is, it is an aspect they could play if they really want to. Um, it, so it's an interesting piece to add. Um, and Eric, as you have the tape queued up here, like, I, I just think as, as we start to go through, you'll just see more and more that it's just like, oh yeah, this, this makes sense. Yep. This makes sense. Yeah. And you're going to see again, that play style and mentality really show up in his film. So, Let's start with, you know, defending the run here. I got him circled off to the right. And you're going to see the motion and shift prior to the snap and how that bumps Edwards and it bumps Justin Reed, number 20, across the screen. They're rocking and rolling those safeties. And you're going to see the tight end come across a formation. Watch him read the flow of this play as that tight end comes across a formation. Then watch him come down the line of scrimmage. You see this guy inserting here. You got a linebacker. He senses this cutback coming. And what's he do? He feathers down. He makes a tackle at the line of scrimmage. That type of processing whether you're talking pre to post snap with the motion and shift. And then obviously after the snap with that split flow and, and, you know, changing gaps, adding gaps on one side, he processes all that in a heartbeat and makes a tackle. Yeah. That's just another example of, you know, whether he's, whether he's processing from a route distribution standpoint or against the run, he's, he's quick and he's accurate in his processing. And I really love this one too, because you can see 56 Karloftis like inserting inside there. And then even, um, you know, 43 there as well. And so Edwards, you know, rather than fit in there as well, he's reading the running back track. He sees where his support is up front. So, Oh, look at, there's this gap open to my left. Cool. Let me fit it. Like he's just structurally sound most of the time in his movement, in his reads coming forward, what he does against both the pass and the run. And that's part of the reason why, again, like he raises the floor for this safety spot may not be the sexiest thing, but just from a reliability standpoint and an understanding standpoint, you know, and can trust him to execute or be where you need him to be. Right. And here's a, another run fit this time from depth. Uh, you see him come down against the Broncos, similar type play split flow. He comes down and fills that C and D gap. Like this is important to teams like the Bills that play a lot of two high safety looks, whether you're talking, you know, cover two, Tampa two, or quarters looks, you got to have safeties that can come down. You got to have nickels that can come down and fill that C gap or, or D gap when those runs bounce. And you see him do that from depth with a really strong tackle on the running back. Yeah. Another example, like the, we alluded to it earlier with, uh, you know, your example, the first time you watched Poyer and him coming from depth, like being able to come from depth in the bill scheme, but just, in today's NFL, knowing how many too high shells and too high alignments you see, you have to be able to come from depth and you have to be able to fit the run. And even more so for the Bills defense, even more so with the Bills defense because they're a nickel defense and usually a light box defense. Like these safeties are involved in the run fit so much. This one is just beautiful. Like you trigger, you come downhill, meet the running back in the hole, doesn't get carried, gets chest on knee. I noticed that a lot for a guy who misses tackles at times. He has some of the prettiest tackles coming forward, like from a textbook chest on knee type of standpoint. And this is one of them here. Um, I just like that trigger. You know, it's quick, yeah. it's efficient, comes forward, downhill. There's no hesitation. Make the play in the hole. Don't give the opportunity. Also, good job from McDuffie, kind of, uh, you know, controlling to the outside and making sure that run goes up in that Continue. alley. And there's yep. Edwards. Yep, there's Edwards to fill. Yeah, and and that's that's what's, you know, great about his play. You saw it on the first time, the first play where he is, kind of playing off of his teammates. Same type of thing happens here. So you see the contained player. He's boxing a play in, but this guy actually spills it with the tight end coming across the formation. So he spills it out to his teammates, and Edwards, he reads it perfectly. As you said, coming from depth and just filling in here. Here's your contain. Everyone doing their 111th. He plays off of his teammates so well, and, and again, just fills really well, whether you're talking from the box or from depth. And you're feeling from alleys. Here's one against mm -hmm. the Bills. Four mm -hmm. strong formation. Bills try to uh, kind of set up that screen to uh, Dalton Kincaid. Look at him work around the traffic Immediately. and make that tackle from the alley. Yes. he. Um, and this was one, too, like I, in watching it, I'm like, is he, does he know this is coming? Is this something they had scouted already? Is he just reading it so quickly? Because you can see as soon as that movement had, like he's already coming forward. But as soon as Kincaid starts to bubble, he shoots, he triggers, he beelines for it. There is no hesitation. There is no doubt. You've got Shakir highlighted there wrapping around mm -hmm. on one man. You've got Gabe Davis on another. And Edwards just shoots it so quickly underneath that there's nowhere to go. By the time Kincaid gets this ball and starts to turn up field, Edwards is pretty much already there. Um, 
And yeah, this ends up turning into like a one or a two yard game because Edwards just triggers on it immediately. Granted, he's already starting to come forward pre-snap, but this, this one is, is a nice play physically, but I see this one again, is another tick for that kind of mental box and that mental high right reel of him processing or kind of knowing what was up from a tape study perspective. Right. And, and speaking of ticking boxes, here's a three safety look. And now you see him kind of in the box as uh, almost like a quasi dimebacker with the Broncos in a three by one set. He's down low. He's showing off of the number three initially, but then you see him pick up and carry the tight end up the seam. I'm comfortable with him doing this type of thing versus tight ends, especially vertical routes where he can, you know, again, judge those angles. I don't want him matching up uh, against speedy guys out of slot, you know, in quarters coverage looks that maybe turn to man. And now you got a speedy receiver on and on Edwards. But these type of plays, you know, down the field, like he can carry tight ends without a problem and, and play that role quite well. And it's something that, you know, Poyer and Hyde did really well for many years. Yeah, there's even a couple of reps of, uh, you know, similar coverages for him against Kincaid in that Bills game. And Kincaid gets the better of him, but Edwards also holds his own, which I think is impressive knowing how much we value Dalton Kincaid as a route runner and as an athletic piece. Um, And again, this is just another aspect of, you know, hopefully everything stays fine with the linebackers this year. And so we don't have to worry about dime linebacker because Terrell Bernard and Matt Milano never have to come off the field and they're playing hundred percent of the snaps, but it's nice to know that you've got this tool in that safety tool bag again for your defense, similar to what they had last year with that combination of Poyer and Hyde. Um, I think you froze up on me there. I think it froze up, but let's uh, Anthony, let's move on to the next play here. So you saw that, two man type look well here you know he's that dime backer but now he's playing more of that cover two tampa two type look and just this read on keenan allen keenan's gonna come up here and just run a curl route and you're gonna see edwards snap those feet and drive on the ball right here and make a play on the ball so again that versatility whether you're talking uh, alignment too high post safety or a dime backer you know that can play man or zone You see very nice instincts here against Keenan Allen, a very talented wide receiver. Yeah, and third down, Keenan Allen runs this Mm -hmm. like just to the sticks or about like a yard past it. And I think Edwards is sitting there knowing that he's got that number three responsibility, but he knows the down, he knows the distance, he sees Allen start to sit and he drives on it, breaks it up, forces that fourth down uh, for the Chargers right there. Again, just a, a guy who trusts his eyes, who trusts his read, and who you as a coaching staff and his teammates can trust to make that read as well. You just see him constantly kind of making these plays. And again, I think a lot of it comes from how he sees the game and processes it from the neck up, understanding down and distance situation, route patterns, combinations, and then the ability to collect from those route distributions and make plays. Right. And here's another play from the Broncos game, three safety look once again, look where he's aligned, kind of that dimebacker. But then watch the processing as this defense unfolds, as this coverage unfolds here. Now he's going to the bottom of the screen. They're running a screen because they have a, a hat on a hat right here. But you can see him already coming here. And then just watch him work through the traffic, much like you saw in those clips against the run. Watch him work through the traffic traffic there, sift through, avoid blocks, and make the tackle at or near the line of scrimmage. That's just great work, pre to post snap moving around, disguising that coverage. They get it locked in. The offense thinks they have leverage. They don't because Mike Edwards comes down, scallops in, and makes that tackle. Yeah, this is that play you see from usually like those veteran dudes or just high-level players at that second level. It just seems like they're never able to get blocked on a screen or washed out. They're able to get out in front and knife underneath or knife outside and cut back in. And this again, this is another example. And this, this has support out to that front side of the run granted Russell Wilson kind of throwing it a little too far behind 19 causes him to reach and kind of throws things out of whack a little bit, but look at the support there for the Broncos. They have the ability to have a hat on a hat going forward. Like they've got two offensive linemen for Edwards and then Justin Reed down there um, at that safety coming from around the 50, but Edwards just gets in so fast and blows this thing up before the play has a chance to develop before the blockers have a chance to get out in front. And again, IDing it, keying in, quick trigger, making a play, something you continuously see uh, from Mike Edwards. All right. And so as we, you know, wind down this breakdown, here's a play uh, again, uh, this time on, in a critical situation, a third down situation, but this time it's more of a single high type look. The Chiefs are manning up across the board. And prior to the snap, you're going to see uh, Kirk Cousins check to this play. 
And so he wants to hit Jefferson. It's third down. He's going to go to his, his boy. He's going to go to his man. McDuffie's over the top of him. And they still obviously want to attack that. But watch <laughs> the range on this slot fade and how Edwards reacts and makes a play on the ball down the field. Still good coverage, but again, that recognition and you know, take letting the quarterback's eyes take him to the ball. It, it goes into why he has so many plays on the ball. You see it time and time again, whether we're talking two high safety looks or these post safety looks. Yeah, the angle to the football, the read, the timing of it. Like when you have the ability to get to the sideline and make a play on the ball from a post safety alignment, that is true safety range. And again, like you said, like Kirk Cousins' eyes take him there. He's cheating over a little bit, probably also understands like, okay, Cousins probably wants to go to arguably the best receiver in the NFL. It's third down. It's a money down in situation and distance. Let me go and kind of cheat to that side. All pieces that are part of his game and that all work. The athleticism to get there with that range, the ability to read the quarterback, understand and anticipate the situation and the play based on the down and what is happening. It Again, it all just comes together and these I, I think these all kind of paint that picture for what Edwards is where he's just always seems to be around the ball somehow he does a little bit of everything and is above average at pretty much anything and everything you ask from a safety responsibility standpoint all right watch this play against the Jets he's a they're in a too high safety look and it's a cover two man and so Snead is up near line of scrimmage he jams the hell out of Garrett Wilson and you can see obviously right off the snap you're going to see Edwards kind of a fall off there. He's going to help over the top of Wilson, but because Snead eats freaking Garrett Wilson's lunch <laughs> at the line of scrimmage, he's looking down. Edwards is looking down. He's like, you know what? I don't have to worry about him. He's not a factor on third down here. And so what does he do? He gets his eyes to the quarterback here, gets his eyes to the quarterback, sees the crossing route coming, doesn't jump it right away. And, but as soon as that quarterback lets it go, then he goes and makes a play on the ball again, third and long. They're always making plays on those critical downs in critical moments. Uh, always around the ball, just great processing on this play by Mike Edwards, which is what put him at the ball at that catch point. Yes. I love plays like these where you don't just have a player kind of covering grass and sticking to where their supposed zone is supposed to be pre-snap. Like he reads, man, that's just, I still can't take my eyes off Sneed. Just Wilson doesn't even get off the line. Like no. that is ridiculous. <laughs> Poor Garrett Wilson, just a rough season with quarterback play. And then a rep like that, like you just don't want to play anymore after that. That's brutal. So Snead doesn't even let Wilson off the line. And so what does Edwards do? Gets his eyes to the rest of the routes going through, makes a play on the ball. Like th this is, this one to me is like the safety similar to like a, a safety equivalent of, you know, when we showed Rasul Douglas highlights or clips last year coming over from green Bay, where he'd be in like cover three or quarters and he would pass things off and see the over coming from the other side yeah. and he'd fall off his man and still stay with that over, you know, that ability to play within your responsibility and your territory that you were supposed to cover pre-snap, but being able to do that within the function of the play, once the bullets start flying for real and once things go live where you're not just a robot and sitting like, well, I'm supposed to have deep half. Like, no, you see what's happening in front of you, read the route distribution, make a play on the ball and it leads him to the ball in that play. Right. Here's another play where they're disguising that coverage. Another third down play. You can see initially prior to the snap, he's coming down near the box and it's like, OK, the quarterback's probably like, OK, are they bringing an overload blitz right here off the uh, defense's left side there? Nope. He's going to move, change his stem a little bit. Now he's off to the right side of the defense and this safety is kind of dropping back here. So they're kind of changing the structure of the defense. So now they're like, OK, this nickel is kind of playing inside. Are they bringing the pressure from this side now? So again, playing with the quarterback pre to post snap and what happens post snap, there's no pressure at all. They're <laughs> dropping everyone out and they're playing quarters coverage and the quarterback, you know, doesn't like it. So he wants to escape the pocket, but you have uh, Edwards playing that low hole as that quarters player. And against this two by two set, he plays low matching the running back. That's part of quarters coverage. And so then when the quarterback escapes, Edwards is there to help make the tackle to force fourth down. Just another another hat that he can wear, another role that you know he can potentially fill. Also, shout out to Steve Spagnolo for just the design of this and the games that are being played pre-snap. Oh, it's just so beautiful with like what he does. And again, another one, like you said, on third down. This one third and long. And you know, Edwards knows that down in distance, plays his responsibility, plays that running back. And as soon as he sees Hertz <clears throat> take off, you can see him just leave Kenny Gainwell. Like Gainwell comes out of the backfield, cool. He's mirroring him, mirroring him, boom. He sees Hertz commit. He commits and he comes forward. He brings his feet. He breaks down. He makes Hertz 
have to beat him. He puts the onus on Hurts to have to make him miss in the open field. Hurts does not. You get a third down stop and a punt for the Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah, again, those third down plays, he he did so so much of that, so much of his plays, you know, in those 11 starts came in those, you know, critical situations and critical downs in certain areas of the field. Uh, I think he's going to be a projected starter for this Bills defense. But let me ask you mm-hmm. real quick, do you think that, how do you think signing him and bringing Rap back affects the draft? Like what type of impact do you think that has uh, for the Bills drafting and safety? Safety is such a weird one. Like the, the safety class is weird as a whole. And then this Edwards move again, one year, 2.8 million knowing his pedigree and where he's come from to your point. Like I'm penciling him in as the starter. I also don't think this, as we continue to use this word and give this <laughs> phrase, I don't think this precludes them from addressing the safety spot because still, even if Edwards works out and he's everything you want him to be this year, right? He's on a one-year deal. Yep. You're still, then you're looking at a safety for next year. So do you want to get somebody in now who can be your safety three potentially this year and then takes over for Edwards next year? Again, a lot of it's going to be dependent on how the board falls. I don't think this stops them from, if they really like, I think it takes them on a safety early. And early. I think a lot of the safeties did that for themselves. Like, I don't think you see a safety. <laughs> at, 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 oh, man. No, like, you're not wrong, but that was a oh, slam. <laughs> it's it's just not. Yeah, it's it's not ideal. Even guys who it's I really like, class, like, man. I really like Cam Kitchens. Right. He's got some warts. I like, I really like Tyler Newbin. He's got some warts. Like, mainly mm-hmm. his hip stiffness scares me sometimes <laughs> with some of the things that he does. But there's, they like, themselves out, he says. <laughs> The tape, man, the tape doesn't yeah. lie. And then especially with like, if the bills hadn't made any move at safety, even though I don't love that value, I can be like, okay, you could talk me into like a safety mm-hmm. at 28 or something, but I don't think it happens early. Um, So do like, are you looking at a safety in round four? I think this puts them more into the realm of some of the guys who I really like on the back end of this class the Malik Mustafa's from Wake Forest, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the Jalen Simpson's from Auburn. I think this potentially takes them out of, unless guys fall, I think this takes them out of the Newbin, Kitchens, Bullard, Bishop, depending on how you have guys ranked. I think that takes Mm -hmm. them out of the top half of this safety class and puts them more into like safety in round four, safety in round five. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say, yeah, three to five. I think... If they can get a third round pick, I'd like to. Yeah, yeah. right. And so late day two, early day three, I think that's the sweet spot for, as you said, probably a majority of the safeties. There are only a few that are top end players, and it's not that strong of a class, but there are some guys that, when you're talking Bill scheme, you know, there are some guys that can fit, but you, and you don't have to, you know, spend a high pick on that Mm -hmm. type of player to, to, uh, especially in year one. Uh, They're not going to ask them. Hopefully they're not going to ask him to play early on. I, I just don't think that I think they set the floor very nicely with rap Edwards and even some of the depth guys that they have, you know, the Cam Lewis's mm-hmm. of the world and Damar Hamlin. Absolutely. And I do wonder too, with, even though it dies like coach and CBs, I wonder if that connection do like, do we see Cam kitchens or Javon Bullard or Tyke Smith, Tyke. the other safety from Georgia who oh, I, I, I like Tyke more as like a big nickel monster man apex type of role, um, mm-hmm. which he really ex- excelled at in Georgia with Malachi Starks and Javon Bullard as the safeties. Um, so th- that's an interesting piece as well. Um, nice comment or interesting comment here from Noah saying, I want an upgrade from rap. He's not an NFL starting safety, a spot starter only Noah Ooh, with some heat. That's on there. strong words. And again, I, I see what you're saying. And to, for the most part, I agree, but when rap did play, he did, he played pretty well. He played mm-hmm. not too hide employer. It's hard because you're mm-hmm. constantly measuring against those. The, guys, I would say the bar is set is so effective. high for safety. It's so player. high. Yeah. <laughs> but he, it, he does a lot of things that they need their safeties to do. Most importantly, just getting guys lined up and communicating. We saw that we broke that down in the film room. Every time, uh, you know, we did defensive film rooms last year, Rap was that guy that was helping out on the back end when when employer and Hyde were not in. Now, athletically and maybe what you want from the top end type of athlete, you're not going to get that from Rap. But he again, it's a it's a steady floor, it's a consistent floor. It doesn't preclude them from hmm. going and getting a safety and having that guy compete at the very least, having that guy compete. But this regime with the that position, I, I think they really like Cam Lewis. I think they really like him, and 
unless he's in there for Taryn, I do think Cam is really well liked. I think Demar, mm-hmm. they're gonna loosen the reins on him when it comes to practice, when it comes to playing. Um, they're you know one year you know removed from everything that's gone through that. So uh, I, I feel your sentiments, Noah. I agree, but I think with this system, I do think that they rely on the football IQ communication, knowing this defense, disguising this the coverages. And I think Rap showed that he could do that. Now, can they upgrade? Can they add some athleticism and different things to that position to compete with him? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's where it comes in. Like I I we said it when they signed Rap. Like I think you it's a high floor move for that position. We wanted to see what they would pair him with. And I think Edwards is a similar step in that mold towards high floor, like, and kind of stabilizing the position again, mitigating the needs on this team. So that way they could potentially address some things in the draft. It doesn't preclude them from doing some things, yada, yada. But if they don't now, if you're not, if you don't get a safety in the draft, if the board doesn't fall your way, you could do a lot worse than Taylor Rapp and Mike Edwards at your two starting safeties. Could things potentially be a little bit better? Sure, but again, yeah. your floor is there. One last one that I started real quick for Edwards. Uh, Roy asks, is Edwards more of a free safety or a strong safety or both? I think a lot of this conversation has really yeah. been on the minds of Bills fans ever since, yeah. you know, because we talk about all the time, like Hyde and Poyer were at the forefront of that movement of kind of removing the strong and free from safety uh, spots with how interchangeable they were. Mm-hmm. What do you see uh, for Edwards? Do you think he's a bit of both? Do you think his skill set leans towards more one than the other? What do you think for Roy's question? So, One, I'm going to give Roy props because the way he approached the question, most of the questions that we had early on when they signed Edwards were approached from the, hey, is he more like Hyde or is he more like Poyer? (laughs) And I think they meant that from, okay, is he a box guy or is he a post safety type? And I like the approach by Roy. Is he a free safety or a strong safety? So I will will say, I think he stylistically plays more like Poyer, but he's interchangeable like Poyer and Hyde. So I think when Hyde was asked to play the post, I think he was more natural back there because of his athleticism and Mm -hmm. his ability to process routes and concepts. But people, when I showed those numbers of box versus uh, deep safety, free safety alignments between Poyer and Hyde over the years, people were surprised to see that they were indeed interchangeable. So I do think Edwards plays stylistically more like Poyer more of the emotional leader, more of the guy that's, believe it or not, if you look at some of Poyer's stats over the years compared to his peers, he's like top five in a lot of safety mm-hmm. metrics. We're talking, you know, basic stats and advanced stats. Stats. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do like that question, but I do think that he is he's interchangeable. I do think he's interchangeable, but I think he brings some of the emotional um, and ball hawking and ball, being around the ball instincts that Poyer has. Uh, along with that emotional leader with some of those big hits, mm. some of those timely plays and just being around the ball. Yeah. Like you said, he's got kind of that, he's got that dog in him, like that type mm-hmm. of intensity and that edge that he plays with. Um, and yeah, I'm in a similar boat. I don't have too much to add with this. I think he has, I don't think he's in a free or strong box. If I had to put him in one, I think he has more shades of a strong safety than he does a free safety, but his skill set overall is interchangeable. And yeah, if we're putting him in Bill's terms, I think he's more of a boyer than he is a hide, but you have that that interchangeability and uh, which again is a nice piece. And it's also interesting considering what that pairing looks like with Taylor Rapp and we'll you know, see what that means. And Rapp. just real quick to, to, to kind of wind this down. So over the course of his career, he had 1,784 snaps at free safety, 720 uh, in the box. Again, he hasn't really been a true starter. So again, maybe injuries played a factor in where he was playing. So there are, and again, the systems he's played in, Todd Bull, Steve Spagnola, you heard McDermott talk about that. It's going to all translate well and, and add in that interchangeability and being around the ball, creating turnovers. It's what the Bills look for in their safeties and in their defenders. And I think he's he's been a, he's going to be a great addition, especially for the cost. Yeah, that again, that's the big thing. Like with everything we look for in towards um, this Bills offseason, everything was in that cost frame and in that yeah. cost filter. 
And Edwards ticks that box. And then from a <laughs> schematic and fit standpoint, he ticks a lot as well as we try to show you folks with the tape. Some of the other stuff that we like to show you folks, some of it sometimes is for our special insiders. And our insiders come from their subscriptions to our Cover One, One Pass, the subscription service that we offer here at this brand. Insider access to certain breaking news pieces that we don't make public, additional film, the Slack channel, a whole bunch of pieces. Um, to give you some more detail on that, we've got a nice little tidbit and some information coming from Mr. Greg Thompson and Mr. Aaron Quinn. Many people ask us the best way to support us here at Cover One, and that is to sign up to become a Cover One One Pass member. That contribution helps give us the access to all the data and information we use to create the content that you love. And I think most importantly, brings you into our community of insiders. It's a great community based on Slack. I know a lot of people don't want to be on social media anymore, or be in on those conversations. We bring all of it to you right in our great community of educated fans. And most importantly, you get access to our content creators. Even better than that, everybody loves merch. You get awesome t-shirts, a cool decal, and a letter from the Cover One team signed directly to you. All for $60. That gets you the entire season, next year's free agency and draft. 60 bucks. Click the link in the description. Cover One Insider. Become one today. We talk about it all the time, Eric. The amount of support that we get from the people here. And it gets, sometimes it's just a view, a listen, a download, a super chat, a comment, the engagement, word of mouth of telling people about the brand and the shows and everything. But this, the, the one past subscribers, the insiders that we have are really the people that um, in many ways are the lifeblood of what we're able to do at this brand with mm -hmm. the tools that we have, the technology we have, the presentation pieces. A lot of it comes from those one past members. Yeah, the ability to do all of that stuff, technology, memberships, comes through our subscribers, but also the content that we create, the ideas that we and topics that we create usually come from our one pass subscribers, our Slack channel. Um, you know, we kind of, you know, we, we show film in there, we drop stats, we drop graphics, and then it, it drums up conversation. And then all of a sudden, these topics come up and we're like, that's an episode, mm. like you can run with that. And so, um, you know, a lot of narratives and stories that you see on social media, are really cultivated in the Slack channel. I, I have it up all day on my phone, on my computer. We have the film channels. We have just general channels. We have analytics, mock drafts, everything. Draft fantasy, channels. Like fantasy football. Fantasy football. We have something for everybody. It's a very cool atmosphere. We liken it to like a country club. Like we're there just shooting the shit all day. Uh, talking about whatever you want to talk about. There's a food channel too for all you foodies. Um, there's something for everyone and it's a great atmosphere. It's a good community. It's a safe space. It's a safe space from Twitter and all the hostility you see on there. That's why a lot of us, you know, especially Anthony and I, we'll, we'll do film, we'll drop some stats and, mm -hmm. and some talking points on social media. But a lot of the discussion um, really comes from the Slack channel and is really done in the Slack channel, including, as you said, some of those nuggets, some of those rumors, uh, you know, signings that are going to happen, um, evaluations, anything um, that, you know, is really kind of like a insider access, we save for the Slack channel for our subscribers. So get to cover1.football uh, to sign up. $60 for the year. You get a T-shirt, a decal. And, um, again, we couldn't do any of this without you. And I'm, I'm not just talking – you know, just recording the technology, the cameras, all that stuff. Even, you know, the, the player relationships, we mm. are able to do that because of you guys. We're, we're able to do that because of your support and, and, you know, our subscribers. So once again, sign up. We appreciate everything. We couldn't do this without you. Yeah. And the Slack channel is, is truly an awesome piece with how much activity is there. And it can be like, if I, if I'm like not in there for like a day or two and I go in and I miss like hundreds of messages that you got to catch up and there's always just conversation happening mm -hmm. somehow, some way people are pulling. It's also a good, again, like you said, like the source of information for people where people are pulling stuff like, Hey, like, you know, you guys saw this or did you see this? And people are pulling articles and news stories. It's not just social media based. And I get a bunch of DMS all the time, which is like kind of my favorite piece of it. Cause it just, it gives us that ability to connect mm -hmm. more with the people who support us the most. And it's an awesome, awesome aspect. And some of our Slack channel members, in addition to some people just who are fans of the bills in general, fans of football, fans of the show clamored for Curtis Samuel, 
this entire off season. I, he was a name that I saw for so yeah. many people being like Curtis Samuel, Curtis Samuel, Curtis Samuel. Like he played under Joe Brady, Curtis Samuel, Curtis Samuel. And it was like, the cost probably isn't going to match up. We'll see right. what could happen. We talked here on the show, potentially wanting more money given towards more of a true X in terms of play style and frame and size. But lo and behold, Curtis Samuel comes to the Buffalo bills on when it's all said and done, a pretty affordable deal with a three-year, $24 million contract coming in with the bill, 6.9 signing bonus, 15 million guaranteed, but an AAV of 8 million for somebody who brings an athleticism and speed dynamic to this receiver group that wasn't really present completely in one player with how he plays. Mm -hmm. This is a very interesting signing given how he's been used, what he's capable of his ties to Joe Brady, and then how he fits in this bills receiver room that already has some established roles present on it. Yeah. There's so many like connections to Samuel, whether you're talking Brady being scouting him and, and kind of evaluating him when he was still in Carolina. Oh, I forgot uh, about that. Good call. Yeah. yeah. And you know, even just things like, like you said, how he's been used, he's been primarily a slot player and even, even more so in 2020 when he was with the Panthers and Joe Brady, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he played uh, primarily in the slot, but he does have that versatility as you can see on the screen. And it's something, again, we talked about at the top, it, whether you're talking alignment, whether slot, out wide in the backfield, but also, you know, the different types of roles you can play. He has the speed to get vertical. Has he done that a bunch in his career? No, uh, he can be that, that guy that gets the ball underneath and the short a dot type throws that gets run after catch and break can break some tackles. Cause he has that natural ability to break tackles because of that running back background. And he's just, he's explosive. He's very fast. I think in 2020, I think it was under Brady he had a 23.7% explosive rate. Um, when Brady was his coordinator, that was number one over the last four years, which Anthony, we did a whole episode on yeah. <laughs> a little while ago about, you know, explosive percentage and the bills yeah. needing to be better in that. Look at this last year in 2023, that is 7.5% explosive drop back percentage. If you look at the wide receiver position, they were 20th overall or in 30th when you're talking, um, the wide receiver position in explosives per drop back. So. Adding a guy like Samuel could definitely boost, you know, their explosive plays. And he can do that again from the backfield in different alignments in matching up versus linebackers on option routes, rail routes, wheel routes. But also, again, in the slot out wide, he can do a little bit of everything. He's going to be a very nice tool and chess piece to have for Brady. Yeah. And in that season under Joe Brady in 2020, you have it highlighted there um, in blue for his alignment rates. And some of the advanced metrics for that year were legitimately really impressive. There were 87 qualifying wide receivers that season in 2020. Out of those 87 qualifying receivers, Curtis Samuel was 23rd in EPA per target, 21st in yards per route run, 7th in on-target catch percentage, mm -hmm. tied for 30th in yards per target, 25th in rating when targeted. And then here's some interesting ones too to kind of tie into his usage. He was 80th in average depth of target at 7.1 and 68th in average depth of catch at 6.6. .6. So despite being like a speed guy, Brady was using him underneath and using him to create mismatches at that yeah. second level against linebackers, slot guys, some safeties. And it's interesting to see what he really will be with this version of Joe Brady, with this Bills offense. Because again, like we talked about, like he's, he just brings an athleticism and speed element that in one package isn't really hasn't been present in this grouping. He doesn't have the precision from a route running standpoint, no. like a Diggs or even like a Khalil Shakir. But when you see him work, you know, he, he understands spacing, he understands leverage, but it's all packaged into this, you know, 4.3 type of frame and body type. And that works in different ways in gadget ways, but true on the line receiver ways. Um, like you said, that chess piece, I think he's a guy who not to kind of pass the buck. I think he's a guy where it's really on it's the onus is on your coordinator or play caller yes. to take advantage of the skill set that he has to maximize his value. And I think that's how we like we outlined and showed that Brady is able to do that. We saw Brady mm -hmm. completely change when you're talking the offense last year, it, when you're talking from the sense or perspective of, yards after the catch they were ranked like 25th in yak uh yeah. with dorsey and then as soon as brady took over they went to eighth they were top 10 in yards after a catch uh yards uh after a catch per reception so 
that's the type of offense that we did a whole episode on it. That's the type of offense <laughs> Brady, you know, came up, came up under Whether you're talking in Carolina as a coordinator, but also to his time back in New Orleans. Um, and I agree with you. I don't think his route running is crisp, but when he adds mm -hmm. that nuance to the route, it's explosive. It's mm -hmm. sudden and mm -hmm. it creates separation. That's why he had, you know, really good separation metrics over the course of the last few years. Um, and, and he does, Justin said it, he gets separation. He does. And we're going to show you, let's get to some of this film, uh, before we run out of time, because, uh, I want to, we have like 15 or 16 clips And one way that Brady got explosive plays, uh, you know, back in Carolina were on play action plays, especially from under center. And man, this is one of our favorite plays over the years <laughs> from Dable's days, wave concept, double post X cross. So you get the double post here and then you just get that X, the X cross across the middle of the field right here by Samuel. And so play action under center. We want to see more from Josh Allen and Joe Brady when it comes to this. And I think Samuel is going to add in that department when you're talking these deep crossing routes that have been missing yes. since John Brown and Cole Beasley left on this you know, wave concept. He has that speed to separate, especially on these crossers, which Anthony, we know Josh loves throwing these crossing, these deep crosses as opposed to throwing just a straight post, which he struggled with the last year. Absolutely. This this is one of this one. I feel like I feel like the deep crosser and the sail route are like arguably like his two favorite throws that he loves to hit and he hits them repeatedly. And what I like about this clip here is it shows two things with Curtis Samuel. It shows his ability to, you know, shows that speed to get across field and have some of that separation. But yeah, look at the athleticism at the catch point. This is a really hard catch. His momentum is carrying him away from where this throw is. His momentum is carrying him to the sideline. This is thrown behind him and it's thrown behind him in upfield. So he has to plant, pivot, extend backwards while falling away. Like that's just a super hard catch. Like look at the bounce off the ground because he yeah. hits so hard. Like the ability to pluck that with his fingertips, really soft hands, and then the body control to bring it in. Uh, Roy, to answer your question, yes, that is yes. Teddy Bridgewater throwing it to him there. Just the the body control and the athleticism in the hands to bring that in, maintain the catch throughout, that's also part of that element, right? It's not just pure speed. It's that athleticism that he bakes in as well. Yeah, 100%, man. And being uh, a, a team that sees man coverage, the number one, they saw it. Man coverage, I think, was 33% of the time last year. Um, you know, that was number one in the league. Getting a guy with this explosiveness, with this ability to separate, you see it here in the low red zone. Uh, watch how he explodes out of the route stem, gets vertical, uses his eyes, and then breaks to the middle of the field after getting his eyes to the quarterback. That type of separation versus man coverage has been needed the last couple of years. Again, we always liken back to the Cole Beasley, John Brown days, but that's when the Bills – shifted their philosophy and said, you know what? We need to get quick guys. We need to get separators. And Samuel hopefully will bring that to Buffalo. Yeah. And th this was a nice one too. Like I like the deception that he creates off the line, but you just see once he puts that foot in the ground, the burst, the explosion, and you know, it, it's nice too. Uh, I want to bring back the, I remember putting out that, um, that tweet, the one highlight of AD Mitchell from a couple weeks ago, and you quote tweeted because I mentioned how he was explosive. And you mm -hmm. talked about how you could be explosive with a speed element, but explosive in terms of like power. And yeah. that's what you kind of see in that step there from Samuel. Although he does have that speed, you just see that power, that burst, that explosion once he pushes off that leg. And I think a lot of it too is tied to that size and frame. Like being a guy who can run a 4 3, and he's also quick in short areas. But he's 5'11, 195. Like, this is almost a dude who's a 200 pound dude in an under six foot body. Like, he's compact, he's thicker, and he's fast on top of it. And when you see that type of movement, it's that force added, almost like a force multiplier to the speed. He's got a lot of power in his steps. Right. And speaking of steps, Oof. look at this power and change Filthy. of direction. Again, yak underneath, just a simple route underneath that hook the curl zone. Looks like he's going to go up the middle versus these two defenders, but watch him change direction, put his hand down, use that balance, and cut back to get some yards after the catch and get upfield. So very good change of direction and athleticism on this play against the Jags. I love this one too because initially it's just like, okay, let me find the space. Like it's, I'm not saying this negatively, but like the initial route is just so like, la, 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 here's the space, let me say it. And it's like he gets activated as soon as he gets the ball in his hands. He gets upfield. And look at the body lean, like how he's almost 
I don't know what angles, like a 45 degree angle. Like once he puts his feet in the ground and has to use his left hand to balance, like he's getting low, you're seeing some lower body flexion. And then again, it's the pop once he comes out of it, right? Like look at the lateral agility, then the ability to get up field. And again, at that size, once he's in the open field, he's got the athleticism to get away from some second level defenders, but he's also got the size to kind of get through corners and DBs a bit. It, it, it's just a really interesting package that he brings. Yeah, and so again, these are clips from the commanders, but you saw that deep crossing route off a of play action uh, when he was with Brady and the Panthers. Single high safety look, and uh, again, those crossing routes with that speed and ability to separate, that's always a threat with him. And I want you to watch how he uses that to his advantage against Kenny Moore, the one of the better nickel defenders in the league. So again, he's selling that crossing route right there. You see Kenny open up to the player, and then watch him snap that off, throw him by, and run that that sale type concept, that three level concept out to the boundary. That is separation. That is explosiveness against a very good corner. Yeah, one of the best, like you said, one of the best nickel corners uh, in the league. Like we we somehow find a way, like every episode, to talk about like Kenny Moore, Taron Johnson, and Mike Hilton as being like the three best like nickel corners. We talk about it all the time. Um, you see this route from him a bunch. He does this against Dallas on Thanksgiving last year, and. You see the explosion, you see the athleticism, the burst, but it's also some of that ability to sell, like that ability to make it seem like, like you said, like, oh, hey, here comes that deep over, like watch me sell it with my eyes and body language, mm -hmm. I'm getting up field, like look where he's looking, look where he's leaning, and Kenny Moore is playing on that upfield shoulder, so he's reading, okay, cool, here comes the deep over, I'm over the top on it. And then Samuel just puts his feet in the ground. I like the hand usage to clear himself through contact. So again, a nice little mix of some technique, but all stemming from, you know, again, and not to sell short the deception and the nuance that he has there with the stem and what he sells initially on the over, but it's all coming within that package of athleticism, speed, burst, explosion, and element that we have been clamoring for in this offense. Yeah, similar type route here against the Giants. Again, set, stemming inside just a little bit, then speed, vertical, and then boom, snaps it off outside after peaking inside. Again, just nuance, and you have to slow it down. Okay, so you see the hezzy release, a little stab inside, gets that uh, defender kind of on his on his heels, and then opening up. And then right here, look at him peek inside, and then snap it off, and then he's got the first down there against the Giants. This one is really beautiful from a like a route running perspective, like understanding how to manipulate coverage. And again, what does it come against? It comes against man coverage. Like this is an example of him separating two too, right? Yes. That's with all the, the multitude of an array of two high safety looks and how that minimizes explosives. What do they get here? They get an explosive, they get an explosive. And this is such a dangerous piece to have when you have a guy who can win inside like this or even potentially outside, but two man has become such a, a prominent aspect really starting in college of like teams mm -hmm. trying to squeeze down that airspace and squeeze windows and availability on third downs and especially known passing situations. We saw the bills use it a bunch down the stretch, including that uh, week 18 game against Miami and Samuel just makes this look easy. Like this creates some doubt in a defense's mind. And it's really nice when you have a guy who creates de a doubt, that kind of doubt in a defense's mind. And it's not Dalton Kincaid or Stefan Diggs. Like it's potentially the third option. Right, and Anthony, I love this play. You're saying creating doubt. Here's a quarters-type coverage. So, again, a coverage that is meant to minimize big plays down the field. He gets matched up on the safety, and this mm. might be one of my favorite routes from him because this is one of those cover or those cover four looks where he's getting deep, he's getting deep, and you can see because of, of him stemming inside, the safety overtakes it. And again, this is supposed to minimize big plays and look at him come out of that break after that that tempo and speed change at the top of the route, man. This is beautiful stuff from him from the wide alignment. So if people are going to ask, like, can he play outside? Yeah, you can see that, especially when you, though you play those kind of teams or coverages that want to, you know, take take that shell and, and, and play it deep so that you can't get those explosive plays. Well, Samuel can get it in a multitude of ways. And this is a common thing. Like be, like you said, because of how he stems this route, he gets matched up on the safety. And you'll see that in those quarters looks like against a multitude of teams who play it. Like the Chiefs do it at times. And I mean, the Bills do it at times. You see Baltimore do it. Like, and you've got a guy who knows how to work in that space. And like you said, it's just the way, how quickly he gets out of this break. Like he turns and leans. And so to Sean Gibson, that safety, he thinks, oh, okay, the route's coming inside. 
But it's not this, just that he fooled Gibson. It's how quickly he gets out of that break that Gibson doesn't have any time to adjust. Like Gibson is still driving right. on that route. And Samuel's already heading to daylight to that open grass that you highlighted right there. Just a better again. throw. This is a touchdown. Isn't Bro, it? I was thinking the same thing. If he just puts that ball out in front of him a little bit more, that's an easy coast to the sideline. Lenore number 38, I don't think is going to beat him to the pylon. Instead, the ball gets put on his inside shoulder and it gives Gibson a chance to uh, kind of make up for getting beat on that coverage. But yeah. that's a really good route and with a better throw and easy touchdown. Here's another uh, play with him as an X. A uh, three by one set isolated to the bottom of the screen and watch how we adjust. So he's peeking inside and then running kind of like what, what the bills used to call a deep V under Dable. I used to run this a ton with Robert Foster where he, he peeks inside, makes it look like he's running across her and then just runs that deep V out to the corner. Uh, but because of the coverage, uh, it, the way it unfolds, he's not going to get that corner because you have a, a, a corner here that's going to drop, and then you have Jesse Bates right here and then a linebacker underneath. So what's he do? He kind of throttles down, gets his eyes to his quarterback, quarterback reads it, and they're able to complete it in the hole. And also a good catch, too. Like a, a little bit on that inside shoulder where he has to adjust his body. You see another example of him making kind of an off-frame type of catch, and we know how much Josh Allen likes guys who can make those off frame catches likes yeah. guys who can separate. So those are two boxes that Samuel also ticks in addition to the dynamic that he adds to the receiver room again. And what's also nice too, like you highlighted on the previous clip, another example of him working from more of an outside alignment. We've heard so much from people and granted we've started some of this conversation, but the need <laughs> for that boundary receiver sure. and the need for that X, um, despite how much he's been used in the slot, you can have him work, um, in that outside alignment as you do on this play against, uh, oh, bland. And this is the one I was that talking speed, about earlier, similar man. to that route. You, mm -hmm. uh, we looked at several plays ago. This one is just gorgeous. Yeah. Here's another one. Again, you have the, Oof. the DB is dropping back and that explosiveness and the ability to make that turn on this big, the big V, uh, route right here to make the turn right there and not lose speed, that type of explosiveness and strength, that leg strength, you're seeing that you know, on the film here. That ability to not lose speed on that break. It's more of a speed break, but he makes that turn and that separation gets locked in on Bland. This one reminds me of like when, when you're taught how to drive a car, like you're supposed to speed, like you're supposed to pick up speed through like the apex, apex. of the turn. Apex, yes. yeah. And that's what this is. Like he is picking up speed through like the apex of the turn for this is when he's on that break. And exactly like you said, like Bland is trying to <laughs> – get his feet as he basically gets crossed up like a point guard here. Like Samuel puts it between the legs and drives the paint and Bland falls all over himself here. But like you said, it's that leg strength and it's the speed. Samuel is picking up speed through that break. He's changing that pace. Like he sells inside with eyes and body language. He also looks back to the quarterback too, which I think is a nice little sell piece as well as he kind of fakes that over, puts his foot in the ground and then you see that acceleration through the break. Yeah. He accelerates through the apex of that turn, and that's when he completes that com he completes that separation and just loses his man. And this is where it gets fun with him. You know, you can put him in the backfield, and we saw the Bills do this a bunch with James Cook. And so having a guy like Samuel, uh, you can add that into the wrinkles the offense can run. You can run these type of option routes. Look at the awareness, though. He sees this defensive end kind of playing that dog technique where he wants to get a piece of him to not let him flare out cleanly and kind of interrupt and, and uh, it, to mess up the timing of that play. He gets inside of that guy, and now he snaps off that Texas route over the middle. Again, just a nice piece to have when you're talking uh, the you know tools for the offensive coordinator uh, with Joe Brady you know, in Buffalo kind of running things now. And this is, you know, this goes back to the graphic you first showed when we brought up Samuel, like those alignment rates. And I hope people weren't too much into just like, oh, slot and wide. Like we showed those backfield alignment reps as well. And this goes back to his time at Ohio State, like his ability mm -hmm. to kind of work out of the backfield as that third down scat back as a type of gadget player. And he runs this route so well. He does it again in that Dallas game against Thanksgiving. You see it here, like his ability to run this angle route out of the backfield and this is pure mismatch like then you're getting yeah. into really fun territory because who's covering curtis samuel out of the backfield and we've seen the bills do it at times with um stefan Diggs out of the backfield this is just another element another alignment and two like if they wanted if they really wanted you could hand the ball off to curtis samuel and let him oh, run we'll it. get to that we'll yeah, get to exactly. that exactly <laughs> and this is a nice little work off of it i feel bad that baker gets hurt on this one but what did we just see 
we saw that angle route on the previous rep. Look at what he does here when he releases out of the backfield on this rail route. Boom, this little hesitation right here that causes Baker to kind of slow down and hesitate, thinking, uh-oh, is he going to go inside? And once Samuel does that, that mismatch really takes over. He accelerates, he separates, gets up the sideline, and makes a great play. Yeah, again, it's going to be fun to watch what they do with him. And this play, it, it's similar. He's in the backfield. Um, watch this split flow. Tell me and alert mm -hmm. me when you recognize this play. Little play action and a throw up the seam. I mean, this play looks really familiar oh, against, me. against Kansas uh, City. This yeah, maybe year. Kansas City and James Cook. I mean, look at that throw from the backfield alignment there. It almost reminds me of this play from the mm. Kansas City game when Joe Brady was a coordinator. James I feel Cook bad, though, on this one, though, now, because <laughs> Mike, Mike Edwards is the safety go screaming yeah, down for is, sure field yeah. who gets beat. So now I'm like, crap. <laughs> yeah, so he's going down to, to take yeah. the flats there. Um, and, and it's, you know, kind of feathered up over the top of Bolton. So fun stuff, man, like fun stuff that you can do with, uh, Samuel. And I think in many ways, you know, if James cook is out, he needs a blow and it's like a passing down or a critical mm. situation, they could easily fill in Samuel in the backfield if they need a receiving type option. Now, if they need more of a physical type option, they go to Ty Johnson or maybe some other running back that they bring in. But I think he does add running back to receiving back ability when you're talking, again, the depth uh, chart in the running back position. And also, you said it, Ant, you can do what? You can hand it off to him. Here are some reps from 2020 under Brady. Outside zone run, you see the elusiveness right there to break that tackle and get that explosive run. So this is a true threat. Teams can't just be like, you know what? No, it's going to be a pass. They can hand it to him, and he has the speed to get the perimeter. This is a real run. This isn't like a gimmicked up, like gadgety type of run. This is straight up. He's in the backfield. You're running outside zone uh, to away from the tight end. Like actually, this is weak side zone, like all day. Ooh, shout out to DJ. Man, the Panthers had some really good had dudes at times, and they just mm -hmm. could not put it together. This is a real run. This is a traditional running run. This isn't, like I said, gimmicked up. This isn't a jet sweep or some type of thing. This is him lined up at running back, running outside zone putting a move on the corner, and then also look at the way he finishes using that size. Like we said, 5'11", 195 pounds. He's got that size and frame. He doesn't shy away from contact, and he plays through it against you know DBs, both corners and safeties. This is also an interesting piece, too, when we talk about roster construction and we talk about value and versatility. Like, does this change what the Bills want to do on game day when it comes to running back? Because you've got James Cook, and you've got Ty Johnson, and then you've also got Curtis Samuel as maybe like, your RB three potentially on game days, in addition to being like a target or option three or four on the day. Like now you can potentially get creative with your roster management on game days in terms of who you add and where you're filling in because you've got this versatile piece that can work in a multitude of ways. Again, another real run on this one here for Washington against the Giants. Yeah, the last one was a zone run, outside zone run. This is more of a counter trade gap run and just a footwork and patience right here. Again, running back, type movements and elusiveness and footwork. It's just, uh, it's going to be interesting to see, as you said, from a roster standpoint, but also from a schematic standpoint, it opens things up for the bills. When you're talking uh, versatility, moving guys around and putting guys at different positions, he's going to be a really fun piece to have. I agree. I think a lot of people immediately made that connection with him and Joe Brady and the Panthers mm -hmm. and all that stuff early on in free agency. But the money we didn't think would fit, mm -hmm. you know, under the bills, um, you know, salary cap at the time. But with all the moves they made and as free agency went forward and progressed, that that number, it, it seemed to lower a little bit more. And, um, you know, for what they got him and what he brings, I think it was typically when you're signing wide receivers in free agency, you're usually going to lose the end of the bargain or lack mm. thereof. Yeah. I think you're going to get your your money's worth for, with a guy like Samuel as long as he stays healthy because of the versatility when you're talking alignments, but also mm -hmm. what you can do with him from different roles in an offense. He adds a lot. He packs a punch, and he can get those explosive plays with minimal touches. Yeah, and again, it, it it's all tied into that. 
the size and the frame and the skill set, and it, it comes together to make him that chess piece, like you said, and you can move him all over and use him in a variety of ways in a multitude of roles. And to get that for three years and $24 million uh, with 15 guaranteed is a pretty good deal. And even when you look at like the breakdown of his contract in year three of it, so that 2026 season, um, he's got a dead cap hit of only $3.4 million and a post June 1st release or post June 1st trade savings of 8 million. So really it's a three year 24, but it could potentially be a two year deal. Mm -hmm. And again, I just think it's worth it for what his skill set invites for what it brings. And you have to think, yeah, I think you also have to not to put the high or the hope too high, but you have to think with Joe Brady already having coached him, like he advocated for this move, he wanted it. So you have to think like there's already a strong usage potential or creativity potential, knowing how familiar Brady is with him and bringing him into this squad to kind of potentially rekindle some things. Yeah, it's going to be exciting to see. Uh, I'm kind of bummed that the season is so far away because these are the hmm. type of things, the possibilities uh, when you're talking personnel and scheme and what could be, what you know they could cook up with a guy like Samuel is just something that um, is exciting to think about it. But the draft is still obviously ahead. And um, as far as the impact of him, I, I still think we're talking boundary guys. I think boundary guy is still on the docket and I don't think the signing precludes them from going and getting a guy <laughs> like that. And it doesn't preclude them early getting a guy like that early. So that is something to keep in mind. I don't think that really, again, draft doesn't impact the draft much. We showed you the, the depth chart. We showed you the roster. Like, I don't think many of these moves really change things aside from the nose tackle position with bringing Daquan back, adding Austin Johnson. Um, I, I do think that kind of locked in and solidified that mm -hmm. position. Cause it's a kind of a niche role, yes. and, you know, and those two guys do those, you know, those skills and traits and they, and play that position very strongly and very well. So I do think that was really the only acquisitions that maybe changed some of the draft implications as far as, um, you know, the draft here in the next month. Yeah. And from, from a receiver standpoint of the draft, which I know so many people are focused on, I, th I do think this move pushes them more towards more of a true X or more mm -hmm. of a true boundary guy. I think this increases the odds of looking towards a Javon Baker or Xavier Leggett, like some mm -hmm. type of big guy who can play that. Like, and you know, I like Xavier worthy. I think this D I didn't really think he was a great fit for the bills. But I think this decreases the odds of someone like that coming through because of what this group looks like. Now, I think you're looking mm -hmm. more for, um, if you're a fan of AD Mitchell, I think he potentially falls into that camp as well. You're mm -hmm. looking for that more of that bigger body, bigger frame, similar to how, you know, the Austin Johnson signing, like we talked about, you know, move them. Okay. Now you're looking for more of a three tech at, oh, and right on cue, here comes a comment. Yeah, so there AD they go. Mitchell, they're I know all going to just, wait for flock, it. they're going to flock in. <laughs> yeah, right? AD you Mitchell, AD Mitchell, AD Mitchell, <laughs> AD Mitchell. Yeah. I think this pushes them towards more of that type, but again, now you don't have to you don't have to look for it in round one. You don't necessarily have to look for it in round two. If, like you said, to lead this episode off, if the board falls to being accordingly, he I'm with can, Justin here. Just so you know, I'm with Justin that's for, right here. You know, I talked about it last night on the show. Like, what I really like with the option of Xavier Leggett is his size, frame, athleticism, and speed, all of it together is a dynamic the Bills don't have. Mm. He's a baby A.J. Brown, which not a lot of teams have, but the Bills And when do we do the wide receiver it. show, you You're may yeah, you may yeah. see some of that film. <laughs> You're going to see that once we get to, which we'll probably get to that episode next week unless the Bills <laughs> do anything crazy. We would have gotten into it this week if I didn't have yeah. the plague last week. But what's also nice with Leggett is he needs to clean up some of his route tree work and his yeah. STEM stuff. But what's awesome is Stefan Diggs is your option one. Kincaid is your option two. If you're talking total touches between receiving and running, James Cook is in your top three. Then you've got Samuel, you've got Shakir, you've got mm -hmm. Knox. You can just let Leggett play to his skill set as a rookie yep. while he develops his game. The drafting of Xavier Leggett to the Buffalo Bills, I think, would be good for the Bills. But also for him, I think it really works for his career trajectory because it doesn't have to put a lot on his plate no, early. It lets him develop exactly. while also helping the team. It's a move that, man, and just – I. I don't know. Dude's like 220 plus and he runs a four, three and he, I and he tackle him, bro. I no. And then him. he's, he's downfield on like 50 yard posts, like playing above the rim floating, and just the floating, yes, not even playing above. Chilling. He's floating. He just got wings. No, he's gorgeous. <laughs> he looks, yeah, he looks like Sean Kemp playing for the Sonics in the nineties, just glides in midair. Yeah. It's going to be, um, 
a real fun opportunity to see what the Bills do at that receiver spot and, you know, with what they've done with Curtis Samuel and really with what they've done with everything here. Like we talked about in this show, Eric, um, as you start to kind of wrap things up and send everyone on their way, um, they've done a lot of moves that have mitigated their holes and the needs that they had. Now they set themselves up to let the board fall to them and come to them uh, come draft time. Any parting words for the people before we say goodbye here? Oh, go grab your drinks and join the fellas tonight. You don't want to miss it. It's a lot of draft talk with John and Daniel, Greg and Aaron. Um, they're they're you know doing some draft stuff. They're doing uh, a mock draft as well. So uh, go grab a drink, use the restroom, and join them in about eight minutes uh, for a Cover One Buffalo. Yes, absolutely. Get your pee breaks in, get your drinks in, maybe get a snack. And that's going to do it for us here in the Cover One Film. If you have not already, please, 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 and thank you, drop a like on this video here on YouTube. It goes a very long way towards helping ourselves and the entire team here at Cover One to track and trend in front of more eyes and ears. So please drop a like on this video here on YouTube. Turn on notifications for the Film Room channel here um, on YouTube. If you're listening on one of the podcast apps or platforms, that's cool too. Thank you very much for your listen and or your download. Please rate and review and subscribe to the Cover One Film Room on those audio-only podcasting platforms. Tell your family and friends and loved ones about Cover One. This is a you know an original grassroots type of company and with how everything happens. So word of mouth is still tremendously appreciated and tremendously helpful for us here on this show and for the brand as a whole. If you have not already, take a look into One Pass. We have it going up in the comments right now with what that link um, entails and what it brings you towards. And we don't pump it just to pump it. Um, if you like what you get on this show and the content we provide, you get that and then some in that Slack channel and in the Insider yeah. and all the access you we provide. If you're in there, you would have kind of known for a while what was going on with Daquan Jones and some of the Gabe Davis stuff and a lot of other pieces that we kind of keep for those folks, but whatever form or fashion your support comes in, we are greatly appreciative of it here in the film room and here at cover one as a whole. That'll do it for us here in this episode of the cover one film. So until next week, Wednesday, 7 PM Eastern, I'm Anthony Prohaska. That's Eric Turner. This has been another episode of the film room. We hope you and your family and friends and loved ones are all doing well and staying safe. Be kind to one another. Take care of one another. We will see you next week. Godspeed. And as always go bills.